Hey guys, uh, this video is going to be a quick high level overview of Photoshop and how to edit raw images in Photoshop. Now the difference between Photoshop and Lightroom is Photoshop has a destructive editor which means that it will overwrite the original image with the edits that you create versus Lightroom which is a non-destructive editor. It basically creates a separate file as a recipe list of all the edits and as you export those images out it will create the image that you have uh, seen in Lightroom but never touching the original it creates a, a different file so uh, in Photoshop though we'll go to file open and we'll come down here and pick an image that we want to play around with so in this instance here we'll use this one so initially we're going to talk about some of these tools up here and then we'll get into some of the settings so the first tool that we have is our zoom tool as you can see we can zoom in each time we left click you can zoom out by right clicking and selecting the zoom setting that you want so in this case here we'll leave it about here our next tool is the hand tool this allows us to move the image around depending on how far you're zoomed in or what kind of crop you have you can uh, move around up or down left and right you can also at any time using any of these tools hold the space bar down and allow you to do exactly the same thing now our next tool here is going to be our white balance dropper uh, as you see here we have our RGB values red green and blue and you want all three of those values to be identical to get the accurate color balance um, for the white balance so 105 106 105 um, so that's probably gonna be about as close as I can get there but you just click on it left click and it'll set the proper white balance for you you can also right click and change your white balance here I know in this instance here for this image that I want it set to about 5650 to get the proper uh, white balance that I want so we'll come back out to like 33 percent and you can see there it's a nice white balance nice accurate colors okay so enough of that now we have our color sampler tool if you want to know what a specific color is you just click on a spot it'll give you the RGB values of that image or that color so in this instance here we got red at 189 out of a possible 245 or 255 sorry uh, green and blue and you can see that so you can clear that just if you wanted to mimic colors later on we have our targeted adjustment brush now real quick anytime you see this little down arrow it means you have additional options that you get to use just by holding the left click down and keeping it held as you go through uh, the screen and then you can select different areas so we've got a parametric curve hue saturation luminance and grayscale mix these will all change different things um, so the parametric curve is basically a linear line uh, you can do a point or a parametric and it allows you to basically create an S curve so you can you know bump up the highlights and darken the shadows brighten the shadows and um, darken the highlights or anywhere in between so it gives you full control where in the image and what tonal range you want to actually tweak versus maybe some of the other settings here like uh, saturation highlight shadows whites and blacks that affect the entire image regardless of what tonal range you're going for so with this it allows you to come anywhere in on the image so for instance this orange bucket and we'll make sure that we set the hue so we can actually change the color of this bucket so we can get red to yellow to orange um, so you get a lot to play around with there you can do this on the skin tones as well I'm just hitting control Z to go back to the default values uh, we're going to play around with saturation, so the saturation, you can obviously make it really high or really low, just going up or down. And it will change multiple sliders over here for you based on the color that you've selected. So in this instance, red and magenta will change the jacket. The black here will be red and orange, but more red than anything. In the snow, you'll have the blues. So you can kind of change that to a more like white color. Uh, so that's how the little adjustment tool here works. Uh, Lightroom has a version of that as well. It's very handy. Um, so we'll mess around with luminance. So if you wanted it to be brighter, darker, things like that, um, just put it anywhere that you want to change that specific tonal range and it will change it for you. Next we have our crop tool. And again, it also has a bunch of different settings as well. So in normal mode, you basically get to select the crop that you want you can right click and bring those options up as well you can just show overlay so that you can get your rule of thirds going here with the normal mode it allows you to free transform especially if you're on a corner so you can do something like that or whatever I mean it's I'm not gonna crop it but 
you get different options here, 1 to 1, 2 to 3, uh, 19 to 16, so it'll just change based on what you select. So like for 2 to 3 it changes a little bit, 1 to 1 it'll change to a square. So you can see there it's got some options there to play around with. Um, you also have your straighten tool, and we'll just hit Control Z on that, Control Alt Z to go back. There we go. All right, so the straighten tool is really handy for landscape photography because if you have a horizon line or any straight line that needs to be perfectly straight in the image, you can straighten the entire image based on that point. So all you got to do is grab and drag. So let's just say that the horizon or horizontal line of the horizon is slightly angled like this. You click on that, it's going to create a crop for you and thus allow it to rotate the image. All right, so the next one here is the transform tool. You can do all kinds of weird, funky things with this. I don't ever use it, but it's there if you would like. You have your spot removal tool. It's going to work just like it does in uh, Lightroom. Basically, you can remove any spot. You can change the size with the bracket keys here, or just come over here to the slider. You also have your feather and opacity as well. So if we wanted to remove this spot off the fence, you just click on it. It changes, and the spot is now gone. The next tool here is the red eye removal. And just to show you that spot disappeared, you can hit P for preview to see the before and after. So that spot disappears. Red eye removal is basically you just click on the red spots and it'll automatically fill it in with black for you. You have your adjustment brush. Now, unlike Lightroom, you don't get a bunch of the preset options here like teeth whitening, skin softening, things like that. So you have to come in here and manually create what you want and do your manual brushing in. So you, again, bracket keys changes your size. You can come over here and change your size as well, your feather, your flow, and your density. You can auto mask if you'd like. This is really handy when you have like a Wacom tablet or a Huey on tablet with the pen so that you can come in and make fine tune adjustments. Um, very, very useful. So the next one that we have here is a graduated filter. Um, this basically just allows you to either brighten or darken the sky while keeping the foreground uh, bright or dark. Depending on how you want to do the image, you get full control over how you want to do that and move it around. And of course you can come in here and change the settings as well, just as if it were uh, an image in itself. So, uh, graduated filter, really uh, a lot of fun, especially if you have, like, say, a really nice blue sky with some clouds, and you have a really nice, you know, field or valley below that you don't really want to alter, but you want the sky to be a little brighter, a little darker. Uh, you could use this graduated filter in order to achieve that without affecting the foreground, and vice versa. So we'll hit Control Z and remove that. You also have a radial filter, which basically applies a vignette around anything that you uh, put this on. So in this instance here, the vignette's inside, so it darkens inside and leaves everything else um, untouched. But you can come down here to Effect and go to Inside and it'll brighten everything inside and kind of create a vignette around the subject. Again, this is all controlled by your exposure settings and different settings throughout here. You get full control over that as well. Useful in landscape photography to highlight certain aspects of an image or enhance certain aspects of an image, not so much in uh, portraiture. Okay, so we'll control alt z we'll get rid of that. Alright, the next setting here we have is the preference dialog. You can come in here and change any preference if you wanted to. Honestly, you don't ever need to touch this, so it's just there if you need it. And then, of course, you can rotate your images. You have your zoom information down here. You have your Adobe RGB 8-bit. Shows you your megapixel size, the PPI. Um, down here, you have your cycle between before and after views. So you can see before and after side by side. You can just hit P for preview, which will show you before and after as well. You also have your um, save before and after settings, and then your copy current settings to the before. So I don't really use any of these down here, to be perfectly honest. Uh, the before and after, though, is kind of nice to see how that works. So, All right, let's move into some of the actual settings of the photo itself and how to edit them. So basically, you're going to start off with your, if we take the radio filter off here, go back to our zoom tool. We're going to start off on this screen, uh, or this tab, I should say, which is your basic tab. You have your white balance here, so you can do it as shot. You can do custom if you want to. Um, whatever you want to do, it doesn't really matter. So in this instance here, I'm going to use 5650. I'm going to leave the tent as it is. 
All right, so down here you have auto mode. You also have an auto mode up here as well if you really want to use that. In the auto mode with these settings, you can kind of get an idea of what you what the program thinks your image should look like for proper exposure, uh, clipping your, your whites and your blacks to get the full tonal range along with getting the maximum exposure for the image itself. Um, I don't find it very useful except to maybe get a base point of what settings I might need to change. So I like to start off on the default and if I notice here, I've got a pretty good tonal range as it is straight out of camera. Um, this was exposed pretty well. The uh, exposure here can maybe go up ever so slightly. So if you would like, you can see this little double arrow button. Uh, anytime you hover over any of these, you can just left click and hold and then drag left to right to change the values of that setting. So in this case here, I might bring it up to about 0.25. Over here on the contrast, you can really bump it up if you want. I like and prefer a kind of a flatter image for something of this nature. And your highlights, um, it's really going to affect like this wall here, the snow, her uh, shoulder on the jacket. Might bring those highlights down just a little bit to bring out some more of that detail. As you can see here, the detail in the hood for like some of the folds and stuff really comes out versus when you really bump it up, you don't see a lot of that. Um, so it's really up to you exactly what you're going for. If you're trying to get the creases and wrinkles and clothes, maybe even in their face a little bit, you can drag those highlights down. If you want to kind of mask some of that out, you can bring the highlights up, make the light a little brighter, a little more even across everything, and it will kind of smooth everything out for you. Uh, your shadows here, we'll just bring those down just a little bit. Your shadows are obviously going to affect the shadow parts of the images, so like up in here under her hood and the background, things of that nature. Um, and you can see exactly on the histogram where it's changing, so right in this area here. Um, the shadows, again, give it a nice little contrast if you want to. Uh, bring it up if you want to bring some of that detail back out of the shadows, so that way that you can view um, some of the finer details that were hidden before maybe, or just keep the image kind of on that flatter contrasty side instead of being so um, contrasty to start with. So. Your whites, uh, one thing that you can do is hold the Alt key and left click and drag and you can see exactly where you're clipping in the image with your whites and the same with the blacks. So generally with the whites you want to just clip ever so slightly or just below the clip point to set your white point. Um, basically what this allows is that um, when you start clipping white you lose complete data in that area where it's clipped. Um, and it only loses that data once it turns white. So when it's red it's not fully lost but it it's blown out a little bit. Um, I like to generally set it to about something like this here. So with the sun coming down, it um, obviously was a little brighter this morning, so it allowed some of that detail in the jacket to come back by bringing that white point down a little bit right in this specific region um, and over here. The black, same thing. You always want to set a black point. If you go all the way black, you're going to lose all detail completely all the way around. Um, so you never want to go all the way black. You do want to clip, though, on the blacks more than the whites, just to bring back some of that contrast into the image. So if you look at our before image and look at our after, it's a little bit brighter, um, but not too much. The contrast hasn't really changed much. Uh, we did drop it down just a little bit so that it wasn't getting affected by some of these other changes. If we left the contrast where it was, um, or pretty close to it, you would see how big of a difference that was in the contrast. So. That's why I like to drag it down just a little bit to try to keep everything pretty much the same contrast as my lens captured, but brighten everything up and bring out some of those details. You have your clarity slider here that allows you to change kind of the softness and hardness of the image. Generally with females, uh, you definitely do not want to have a really high clarity. Uh, for males, it's a whole different story, especially with black and white um, and having beards especially too. It's great. Uh, throw that sucker in black and white, bump the contrast to max, and do something like this, and you're going to get a real nice grungy, uh, you know, kind of masculine feeling image. But for females, you definitely want to keep things softer, um, so you wouldn't really want to play with the clarity too much here. Vibrance and saturation. Now, these two do very similar things, but in very different ways. So, vibrance is going to affect just kind of like the mid tones, the the colors that aren't really popping as much, um, whereas saturation is going to affect the entire image. So if we take our vibrance here and just kind of tweak it a little bit, you'll see kind of like her gloves, her bucket, they change. 
Her face isn't really changing much. The background's really not changing much. Um, to get back to zero, you can double click at any time and it'll bring you back to zero, by the way. Um, now if we do saturation as a whole for the entire image, you're going to see all kinds of crazy changes. So um, that's the difference between vibrance and satur saturation. They pretty much do the same exact thing, just in two completely different ways. All right, moving on, we have our tonal curve, or our tone curve, as some people uh, prefer. And this is going to allow you to create that S-curve I was talking about. So here we're in parametric, and we can also do point. Parametric allows you to change just specifically the highlights, the lights, the darks, things like that. Uh, tweak them however you'd like to. Again, just double-click to bring any of those back to zero. On the point curve, you can change each individual channel, red, blue, or green, or red, blue, and green together. So in this instance here, we're kind of in the shadows at this point. If we wanted to darken those shadows up, but bring our highlights up and give it more contrast, we could do that, or we could do the reverse effect and come back in here and move those and make it less contrasty. It's completely up to you. So we'll bring that back to zero. So that's the parametric and point curve for the linear lines here on your tone curve. The next tab we have is our detail tab. Now this detail tab allows you to sharpen images and reduce noise at the same time. So the two main sliders you're going to use is, or I should say three, is the amount of sharpening, the masking, and the noise reduction for luminance. So with the amount, you're basically going to, let me zoom in here so you can see exactly what's going on. You can see here, it's already a pretty sharp photo as it was, um, even if I drag it back down to the default that it was at, um, which I believe is 25, yep, pretty sharp, nice and crisp. Uh, you can sharpen that even more. The more you sharpen though, as you notice, the more detail is coming out and also the more grain and the more noise. So you don't want to overdo sharpening by any means. Uh, since this was a pretty sharp photo as it was, there's not really much need to sharpen too much here. You can see the before and the after. It does sharpen it up a little bit. Um, now, if you don't want to sharpen the entire image or the entire subject, you can come in here and hold your Alt key on masking. And you can drag and it will actually show you a new diagram. Let me zoom out here so you can see exactly what's going on. So as you drag this masking key, uh, or the slider with your Alt key held, you can see white and black. Now everything in white is going to be sharpened, everything in black is going to be left alone. So you can sharpen the entire image, as it is by default, or you can sharpen just the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the outlines, things like that, to kind of crisp things up. So very useful when you're doing portraiture, um, especially for facial retouching, uh, skin retouching, things like that. You generally don't want the skin to be super, super sharp because there's blemishes and things of that nature going on. So, But you do want the eyes sharp and things like that and the key features. So using that masking with the Alt key quickly allows you to select exactly what features you want sharpened while leaving everything else untouched. Now the noise reduction for luminance will zoom, zoom back in here. So if you crank this up all the way, it kind of gives everything a softer plasticky feel. Um, if you leave it all the way down, it leaves everything nice and crisp. So if you have a really high noise image, for instance, you were doing some night photography or low light photography, you had to crank up the sharpness a little bit and you're trying to salvage the image, this luminance will help you in order to be able to bring some of that detail back without getting too noisy by reducing some of that noise and softening a little bit of it back out. Now, of course, you can do um, the unsharp masks and things like that, but for this experience and this uh, tutorial, we're just going to cover what's uh, available to us here. The other sliders you don't really need to mess with too much in this uh, tab. So, uh, All right, we'll go to our hue, saturation, and luminance and grayscale tab. So you can convert to grayscale just with a simple click of a button, or you can change the HSL of each individual um, slider for the colors and the image. So here you can come in here and you can change, again, all this stuff here. Um, quite honestly, unless you're doing like major editing to the entire image's color scheme, I would come up here and use the targeted adjustment tool to target the specific color and areas that you want to change because it'll automatically calculate the different values. It'll automatically calculate the different sliders that need to be used because it's almost never just one slider. It's always going to be multiple sliders to get the effect that you want. So with the hue, obviously it's going to change the actual hue of red or orange. So as you can see there, it changes the hue of the entire image based on where those colors are. 
saturation as everybody knows will make it really bright or really gray really vibrant so um, be careful with that if you're trying to reduce maybe some of the uh, colors if your lens you know captures something super colorful that's really overpowering an image and allowing it to take away from the weight of the image um, you can use the saturation to kind of bring that down a little bit to try to mute it a little bit more so it's not having such physical weight or visual weight in the image and distracting from the main subject luminance tab is going to make things lighter or darker so we can make the reds really dark we can make them really light and give her nice rosy cheeks and pink gloves um, things of that nature so again targeted adjustment tool probably the better choice to use for something like this rather than changing the entire image but this is handy in landscape when you're tweaking the sky or you're tweaking you know a lake or maybe the the green forestry things of that nature so you can use the sliders for that instance the next tab that we have is split toning again if you had something similar to like a really nice blue sky with a really nice green field you can come in here and do split uh, split toning on that and change the balance and how it weighs on each other uh, not something I use very often at all lens corrections is a very big one so you have your profile here you can remove chromatic aberrations and enable profile corrections so what this will allow you to do if you're using any newer lens that's an autofocus or you know made within the last 10 years or so basically it's going to know what the distortion rate is it's going to know what the vignetting is on that for specific profiles so for instance if we went to Canon even though I'm not using a Canon camera uh, so say you were shooting with a 50 millimeter 1.4 you can come in here and you can see that change that it made. You can see the distortion that it fixed. Okay. So it's just a really easy way and a really simple way to come in and remove chromatic aberrations, which are going to be uh, purple or green fringing on items in really high contrast areas. So shooting a leaf against a bright sky uh, generally creates some kind of chromatic aberration. Um, so that'll automatically remove it. Now, if you're like me and you use a lot of manual lenses, you can come in here and do it manually for yourself. So you can adjust the distortion as needed. Now, as I'm sure most of you probably already know, when you're using a wide angle lens, it's going to make everything look more distorted and wide. If you're using a zoom lens, a really high zoom lens, it's going to compress everything. So generally, a 50 millimeter to an 85 millimeter is considered kind of like the gold standard of compression and distortion for people and their faces so if you're using anything more than that you will need to make sure that you enable profile corrections or change the uh, distortion yourself to kind of bring their face back in line you can also do your defringing down here as well so you can change the purple threshold uh, the hues greens things of that nature you can also do your vignetting. Uh, if there's any vignetting on the lens naturally, um, you can come in here and correct for that. Now, again, as we talked in the meeting tonight, you know, vignetting on every image really heavy is a no-no. Um, so, you know, there are some lenses out there that naturally vignette and in certain conditions will create really strong vignettes. You can come in here and correct for that as well. Okay, so our next tab is our effects tab. So this is where you can kind of dehaze things. It kind of, you know, brings the haze in the skyline or something of that nature somewhat under control depending on how bad it is, but it'll clear up your image and make it a little bit more usable. The next thing here is grain. You can add photo grain to the image and uh, you can take it away. So if you're wanting to go for a more like artistic kind of older image feel, throw in some photo grain there, not a problem. Then you have your post crop vignetting, which is your main vignette that you can come in and do. And you see people do this all the time or do this all the time. Yeah. No. No bueno. Uh, you can change the midpoint, the roundness, though. If you went down here and you wanted to feather that out some, you could feather that out to make it look a little bit more blended. You can make it harsher. Um, you can change the highlights. And you'll see that changing up over here. Uh, you can change the roundness of it. So again, I don't ever use it. Um, I don't recommend using it if you absolutely can get away without using vignettes. So over here in the camera calibration, it's just going to go through some basic defaults. Uh, you don't really need to touch any of this. Presets is where you can have a bunch of your actions already. So if you have like, you know, any kind of presets for black and white or anything that you create yourself, you can have those over here, load them up onto an image automatically with a click of a button 
presets loaded, you're good to go. Then you have your snapshots. Now snapshots are going to work identical to the way Lightroom works. Um, basically you can edit an image, get it to the way you want, create a snapshot, re-edit the image again, completely different, create another snapshot, and you can quickly cycle back and forth between the two without having to go back and keep re-editing every single time. Very useful feature, very handy, and uh, very simple to use. Now, with Photoshop being a destructive editor, you do need to take a couple precautions in order not to overwrite your original image. The first one being, hold the Alt key and you can open a copy of this image that you just created. So that's probably the primary way that I always open any photo when I'm editing a raw image so that I don't overwrite my raw because once it's overwritten, there's no getting it back if you don't have another copy of it somewhere. So you really need to make sure that you don't destroy that original photo and you open a copy of that photo instead. Now, with that being said, that's pretty much how you edit images in Photoshop uh, for the very bare bones, basic high level overview of what some of the sliders and stuff do. So I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Uh, if you guys like this video, let me know and I'll continue to make more. I have a lot more information and a lot more things that I can go into with Photoshop in regards to compositing, in regards to cutting out and getting that perfect cut every time, blending images, uh, panoramas, HDR, astrophotography. I mean, it's there's not much I can't do in Photoshop. So just let me know um, if this gets uh, good enough uh, success in regards to the feedback I get I'll continue on with the videos but for now um, when you open an image again just hit open copy you can come in here file save as and then you can save a PSD you can save TIFF JPEG however you want to do it I'm not going to save this image but uh, yeah that's how you do it you can create a custom brush to apply your logo um, you can also just open your logo drag it in after you cut it and then resize it however you want to do it uh, so that's Photoshop, guys. Thank you for watching.